Hello everybody, welcome back to Learn It. We're on lecture 3A where we're going to learn about the emergence of Mahajanapadas. The period that we're going to talk about happens to be 600 BC to 321 BC. You remember when we talked about LVP, I mentioned that LVP will be a transition phase. From us living in small mud huts to now us establishing statehood. Statehood or kingdomhood is nothing but the emergence of Mahajanapadas. When you hear terms like kingdom, dynasties, it is nothing but the foundation stones of all these terms were laid here in this specific period. When I talk about another period that is 500 BC, remember that it is it marks the climax of the later Vedic period. It also marks the emergence of Mahajanapadas. That is, this is an overlapping period. It is during 500 BC that India will witness its second phase of urbanization. The date that we associate to the second phase of urbanization, the period rather, happens to be 500 BC. Now, when I talk about statehood or state, what are the components of a state? A state has to have a defined territory, population, Sovereignty, a supreme power has to be there. Standing army and regular taxation system. Let's look at each one of the society period by period and see whether these societies fulfill these criteria or not. When we talk about IVC, there were different different sites, but these sites did not have a defined territory. So let me mark it with a cross. When I talk about population, IVC certainly did have population. Sovereignty was still doubtful. Remember, the historians were divided into two groups here. Whether it was an oligar oligarchical setup or maybe just one king ruled. So, whether it was monarchy or oligarchy. So, let me put a dash here. Talking about standing army, IVC did not have a standing army. IVC did not have a regular taxation system. It was historians that extrapolated that maybe IVC people also had a tax taxation system. So again, a blank here. Talking about early Vedic period, did they have a defined territory? Absolutely not. They were living in small, small groups. Did they have population? Yes. Sovereignty? No. Why? Because remember, Rajan had limited powers in the early Vedic period. Standing army? Again, a no. Regular taxation system? No. Bali was voluntary. Talking about the later Vedic period, did it have a defined territory? Again, no. Did it have population? Yes. Sovereignty? Yes. Because Rajan now practiced unlimited powers. He was the supreme authority. Standing army? LVP again did not have a standing army. Regular taxation system? Yes. Bali now became mandatory for everybody. One-sixth of the produce was now compulsory. Tax evasion was a crime. So let me put a tick here. When we talk about state... It has to have all these five criteria ticked. IVC was two, or was one out of five. EVP is again one out of five. LVP marks three out of five criteria. When we talk about Mahajanapadas, we'll again come back to this chart and you'll see that we've ticked every box here. Which is why we say that the emergence of statehood began during this period. Moving forward, when I talk about Mahajanapadas, a lot of, you know, literary records that were compiled during 600 BC mention 16 Mahajanapadas. The term is 16, that we're very certain of. But what are these 16 Mahajanapadas? That we're unsure of. Because every single literary resource mentions a different set of 16 Mahajanapadas. We are going to take into consideration two literary records. One happens to be a Buddhist literary record, that is Anguttara Nikai. The second one happens to be a Jain literary record, that is Bhagavati Sutra. These two literary records mention 16 Mahajanapadas that are highlighted in this map. And I'm going to go alphabetically. The first one happens to be Anga. The second one happens to be Asaka. It is the southernmost side. The third one happens to be Avanti with the capital Ujjain. The fourth one happens to be Gandhar. With the capital Takshila, you may also note down the capital. So Gandhar is the fourth Mahajanpada with the capital Takshila. 
Kosala happens to be our fifth Mahajanapada. Now Kosala has two capitals. Number one being Ayodhya and number two being Shravasti. You will see all these sites here in the map. It's highlighted. When talking about Kashi, it's the number sixth Mahajanapada. It's got Banaras or Varanasi as its capital. Number seventh Mahajanapada happens to be Kuru with Indraprastha as its capital. Number eighth Mahajanapada is Kamboj. Number ninth Mahajanapada is Malla. Now Malla again has got two capitals. Capital number one being Pavapuri. I'm only mentioning the important capitals. And the number two capital happens to be Kushinagar. Talking about the 10th Mahajanapada, it happens to be Magad. Now Magad also has got two capitals. Capital one being Rajgir. Capital number two being Patliputra. Number 11th Mahajanapada is Panchal. Number 12th is Surasena. Number 13th Mahajanapada is Vajji with Vaishali as its capital. It's mentioned VRJI. It could also be written as VAJJI with Vaishali as its capital. Number 14th is Matsya. Number 15th is Chedi. Number 16th happens to be Vatsa. And among all these 16 Mahajanapadas, it was Magad, the kingdom of Magad that emerged the most powerful and victorious. So let's look into the kingdom of Magad. When we talk about the kingdom of Magad, you may see here that it covers parts of Chota Nagpur Plateau. So it is very clear that it is going to have natural resources. And Magad did have iron ore deposits, which is why people use these iron tools for deforestation and settling down here. Now, people who settled here also practiced extensive agriculture, which is why Magad had very Magad became a very populous as well as a very powerful estate. Now, talking about Magad, the first capital of Magad was Rajgi. It was the strongest kingdom. It was the strongest Mahajanapada in the 6th century BC. And when we talk about Magad, it can be divided into three periods or dynasties. What were these three dynasties? Let's look into it. The first dynasty to ever rule the kingdom of Magad was the Haryanka dynasty. And the rulers, the first ruler happens to be Brihadrata. Now, Brihadatra was the founder of Haryanka dynasty. And it was Brihadrata who made Rajgir as the capital of Magad. When talking about Rajgir, it was surrounded by five hills. So naturally, these five hills acted as natural fortification. Rajgir was, became very secure and Rajgir was the capital of Magad. Talking about the second rule, ruler, he was Bimbisar. He was the son of Brihadrata. He was one of the greatest rulers. We call them goat in today's language. So Bimbisar was one of the goats. He was very welfare oriented. And one thing to note here is that Bimbisar was contemporary of two great people. Gautam Buddha and number two being Mahavir. Now Rajgir became impregnable. How? You remember I told you that Rajgir, let's say this is Rajgir, it is, it is surrounded by five hills. One, two, three. 3, 4 and 5. There are going to be gaps in between these hills. So what Bimbisar is going to do is that these gaps, he'll attach, let me just choose a color, he'll attach wooden and stone walls here. Such that these gaps have now become, these gaps have now been eliminated. After, furthermore, what he'll do is that he'll also chain all these things together to give another layer of protection to the capital of Rajgir, which is why Rajgir now became impregnable. In the night, what used to happen is that he used to shut these walls. These stone and wooden walls used to shut down at the night. So now Rajgir became very, very... Nobody could enter Rajgir without the permission of the guards that were stationed here. So Rajgir became impregnable. And it was Bimbisar who introduced two major things. One was standing army. Remember we talked about standing army in the chart that we drew. 
so we saw that whether it was ivc evp lvp they did not have a standing army it was bimbisar who introduced standing army the an, another thing that bimbisar introduced was elephantry now see when we talk about magad nagad occupies parts of odisha parts of southern bihar where we have got elephants in very many numbers so he was the first person to introduce elephantry in warfare and bimbisar followed two policies of annexation one was either through matrimonial alliance or through aggressive wars when we talk about matrimonial alliance there are two stories here the first one happens to be that he married the kosalan princess whose name was kosala devi and bimbisa received kashi in dowry at that time the kosalan king the kosalan ruler was prasannajit and how was kosalan devi related to prasannajit kosala devi was the sister of prasannajit so what happened was he associated a matrim bimbisa rasu bimbisa established a matrimonial alliance here with the with the city with the mahajanapada of kosala the second thing what bimbisar did was that he married the lichavi princess chelana now at that time lichavi ruler was chetaka and chetaka only had one condition from bimbisar that bimbisar if you want to marry my princess you have to make sure that the prince that is born via chelana becomes the next yuvraj and becomes the next heir to the throne so what happened was chelana and bimbisar give birth to ajata satru who is going to be our next ruler where exactly is lichavi it's a small clan in bihar and the capital of lichavi happens to be vaishali remember let's say this is vaji vaji also has to have small small clans so the big kingdom the big mahajanapada happens to be vaji and one of the small clan happens to be lichavi so anyway technically also lichavi is also going to have have the same capital as vaji so lichavi had vaishali as its capital moving forward to aggressive wars now see here we have a small story when we talk about aggressive wars bimbisar annexed all other janapadas except one that janapada was avanti so what happened here is that avanti had a ruler the ruler's name was chanda pratyoda and magad on the other side was ruled by whom our infamous bimbisar what happened was that a long battle was impending between these two janapadas so we were all expecting a war between chanda pratyoda whom we're going to call our chanda and bimbisar magad's bimbisar now when the war was about to take place a battle was about to happen between magad and avanti but in the meantime we see that our chanda our cp got affected and infected with jaundice unfortunately now bimbisar being such a prominent ruler he said no no i don't want to have a battle when the king is not ready and plus what he did was bimbisar sent to avanti a royal physician bimbisar's royal physician whose name was jivaka why was jivaka sent from magad to avanti to treat archanda so bimbisar said that jivaka you go to avanti you treat chanda pratyoda chanda was so much happy and relieved that by this gesture of bimbisar sending jivaka chanda in return agreed to give his daughter for marriage and this is how magad and avanti who were once rivals became alliances and now bimbisar began his administration it is also an established fact that bimbisar met buddha at rajgir and later he got converted into buddhism so bimbisar by religion was a buddhist now bimbisar coronated his son ajata satru you remember the princess from the story the lichavi princess chelana now chelana and bimbisar gave birth to ajata satru 
and now this ajata satru was coronated by bimbisar as the new yuvrajan as the new rajan so ajata satru has now become the raja what ajata satru saw that i have become the king but people are still in favor of bimbisar only people are still liking that liking him and that ajata satru didn't like so he what he did was he imprisoned his father and his father was killed by ajata satru so ajata satru committed patricide and that is how we come to our next ruler that happens to be ajata satru so ajata satru who comes next to the throne is also considered to be one of the most prominent one of the most greatest magadhan ruler he was an aggressive ruler which is why he followed the aggressive annexation policy and it was ajata satru who constructed the site patliputra on the confluence of three rivers ganges river ganges river gandak and river son this was our patliputra so he constructed the city of patliputra on the confluence of all these three rivers now what happened was ajata satru at the end of the day you'll have to understand he has killed his own father so he has that guilt and he you know when later in his life he still had that guilt that okay i've come to the throne i was given the throne yet i killed my father so he felt very guilty which is why he met mahavir he met mahavir first at rajgir and then he asked mahavir then what should i do what should i do to get rid of this sin later he also met gautam buddha and asked the same question what should be done such that i get rid of this sin i feel very guilty that i have killed my own father and he liked the teachings of gautam buddha and later got converted into buddhism one second let me write it down and which is why when he got converted into buddhism we see that in 483 he 483 bc he convened the first buddhist council first buddhist council was convened here at rajgir certainly what happens is sadly the apple doesn't fall for fall very far from the tree so what happened was ajata satru unfortunately was also killed by his son udayin udayin who was ajata satru's son committed patricide again this time it was not just patricide udayin killed a reigning king ajata satru was a king when he got killed by udayin so udayin didn't only con- didn't only commit patricide but he also committed regicide which is killing a reigning king which is why we move on to our fourth ruler who happens to be udayin or udayana bhadra so when talking about udayin he was somebody who killed his own father not just father he also killed his reigning king so he committed regicide now mind it he was a jain his father and grandfather were both buddhists by religion but he was a jain it was udayin who shifted the capital to patliputra and now patliputra becomes the capital of magadh which is why we see that magadh had two capitals now udayin was killed by his own minister one of his nobles who was called shishu nag which is why the next dynasty or the period that we're going to study about happens to be the shishu nag dynasty moving to shishu nag dynasty it's a very small dynasty we're only going to learn about two rulers here the first one of course happens to be shishu nag he was the founder and he was it was him who shifted the capital to vaishali remember the capital was partly put, the first capital was rajgir then the capital became partly putra and now it is shishu nag who has now shifted the capital to vaishali so there are three capitals now now when we talk about the next ruler he happens to be kalasoka he was the son of shishu nag and he was a buddhist by religion 
which is why in 383 BCE we see that he, Kalasoka, convened the second Buddhist council. Where? At Vaishali, because Vaishali is the capital now. And Kalasoka was killed by his own minister called Mahapadmananda. Which is why the next dynasty that we are going to look upon happens to be the Nanda dynasty. So see, according to the vernacular system, you remember the four Varnas. So according to the vernacular system, Nanda dynasty had a Shudra origin. And looking into the kings, the rulers of the Nanda dynasty, we begin with Mahapadmananda. He was a Shudra by going by the vernacular system. He was a Jain by religion. He was a very aggressive ruler. And it was Mahapadmananda who shifted the capital back to Patliputra. Now he annexed the kingdom of Kaling. Why did he do so? Where exactly is Kaling? So let's say this was us time ka India. So we see that Kalinga is somewhere here. Southernmost part of Odisha. Southernmost. Just a minute. So what we see is that he had, Mahapadmananda had three primary specific reasons as to why did he want to annex Kalinga. Number one being he was a ruler, right? So he had ex ambitions of expanding into the world, conquering the world. So number one being the simplest of all the reasons, ambition to expand. Number two being Kalinga had lots of ports. Kalinga was a port city. So to trade, ports were the major section. You know, it was via ports only one could establish trade. So, trading was another factor. Number three was that he wanted to enter South India. And what better way to do it with Kalinga? So, he established victory Kalinga may offer. People had a fear of him and this was his way of entering the southern part of, of the country. So, one step towards entering Southern India. Now, what do we see is that there's a brief story here also. So, he emerged victorious. Mahapadmananda had won victory over the kingdom of Kalinga. And it was, via, it was from this kingdom that he took a Jinna trophy. To show to his people back in Patliputra that, look, I have emerged victorious. I have Kalinga. Ko. And Mahapadmananda had a natural death. After Mahapadmananda, we see that weak successors were followed. Weak successors followed Mahapadmananda. So we directly come to our next ruler, who happened to be the last ruler of the Nandan dynasty, who was Dhanananda. Now he was a very unpopular among, among his subjects because he was arrogant and he levied very, very heavy taxes on his people. And it was during the Dhananandas period that Alexander invaded Punjab. At the end of the day, we see that Dhananda was killed by Chandra Gupta Maurya, which is why we will see that after Buddhism and Jainism, we are going to learn about a new dynasty, a new empire that is going to be the Mauryan Empire. The foundations were laid here. It was Chandragupta Maurya in 321 BC who killed, the Dhananda, who killed Dhananda, which brings us to the end of the Nandan dynasty. We'll now look into a very small, a very brief passing by topic that happens to be invasion of Alexander. Let's learn about a very brief yet interesting story that has to do with Alexander's invasion in India. So what happened? This is a story pertaining to 4th century BC. Now what is happening is that somewhere here we have the Greeks, somewhere here we have the Iranian Empire. Now the Greeks and the Iranians are fighting amongst themselves to establish world supremacy. We are talking about 4th century here, 4th century BC. What happens now is that Alexander, who hails from Macedonia, 
has overtaken the Iranian empire and he is moving further eastward alexander knew about geography he knew that okay there is a world called india that is very rich in resources and minerals he knew about our wealth he knew about our agricultural patterns and how rich we were generally in resources so he was very tempted to come and conquer our land so now he enters india via kabul khyber pass khyber pass and it was 326 bc that he enters india now when he entered india did he immediately re- reach river indus absolutely not it took him 5 months mind it to reach from khyber pass to river indus upon reaching river indus he met with ambi who was takshila's ruler and what ambi did was he surrendered before alexander's huge army ambi also gave alexander a lot of gifts and presents now alexander is moving further inside alexander reaches river jhelum what happens is on the banks of river jhelum he is met with another ruler called porus so he has a battle there alexander and porus fight the battle of hydas pass or it's also called the battle of jhelum here porus is defeated by alexander but one thing is for sure that alexander was very impressed by porus's bravery what alexander does is ki chalo porus you fought a very nice battle i'm very impressed by your bravery i'm going to return your kingdom back to you and alexander also made porus his ally what happens is that now alexander wants to move further inside our territory so he goes he he comes to river pyas on the bank of river pyas it is where he is defeated by his own army the great alexander is now defeated by his own army what happens is that it is on the banks of river bias that alexander's army tells him ki it's been 10 years we have been fighting and fighting only we've lost so many of our friends some of our friends have retreated back back also it's time alexander let's go back to our home a home sweet home let's just go back it's been so many years we haven't seen our family so now alexander sees that his army is mentally emotionally drained he goes back to collect recollect a huge army now these people who were sitting the army of alexander that was sitting on the banks of river it is said that they were also fearing the magadhan army in general so now alexander he decided to retreat back and upon retreating back it was in babylon in 323 bc that unfortunately alexander died he caught very high fever and it was in 323 bc that alexander died after his death what happened was that porus declared independence now after porus died what happened was that the greek governors that alexander had appointed these governors were called satraps to take care of alexander's occupied territory after porus's death satraps declared independence this is how we mark an end to this chapter after which we're going to learn about buddhism and jainism in the next chapter see you very soon have a wonderful day thank you